My name's Helen Lester and I'm going to talk about whether or not financial incentives improve quality of care. So, over the next 30-35 minutes, I'm going to talk about where we've come from in terms of financial incentives in primary care, where we are now and why, and then I'm going to talk about where we're going, so the influence of the white paper, for example, but all within the context of quality of care. So, to start with, let's define what I mean, at least, by quality of care. I think most of the evidence base would suggest that good quality care means that you have speedy access to safe and effective care. Now, that's defining quality of care at a patient level. You can also, of course, define it at a population level, in which case you're talking about the equity of care and the efficiency of health care delivery. Now, today I'm going to talk very much about uh, uh, quality of care at the patient level, but I'm going to just touch on equity as well. So a little bit of background. 20 years ago, when I was a new general practitioner, really we didn't talk much about quality of care. There was a feeling that every GP was just as good as the next GP. And then slowly there began to be a recognition, in fact, that there was variability uh, in, in terms of general practitioners and indeed within the wider medical profession. There was also a recognition by the government of variation in care. And we also began to have the means to actually measure these variations in care. There was, for example, increased computerization across practices. And there were a series of different quality improvement initiatives, such as the National Service Frameworks, which began in 1999 with the NSF for Mental Health, and the rise of audit, and of course also the rise of evidence-based medicine. I'm, I'm sure there are many general practitioners out there who will remember guidelines coming out of our ears, and as this slide shows, up to our ears as well. And there were more negative drivers, of course, uh, around variation in quality of care, including Harold Shipman, which I think we need to at least recognise historically was part of the driver to improve quality of care generally. But in fact, as you can see from this slide, care was beginning to improve from the late 1990s, long before the quality and outcomes framework reared its head. Now this slide is taken from a research project called QUIP, run by the University of Manchester, and we will come back to this slide and we will add more evidence on as this story progresses about the quality of care. But QUIP involved 42 representative practices from across England who collected data from 1998 in many different disease areas, but particularly, and the slides that I'm going to show, will represent the data from uh, angina, from diabetes and asthma. What you can see in those three clinical conditions over that period there from 1998 to 2003 is this slow but steady improvement in health outcomes in those three major chronic conditions. Of course, the other bit of the story that we really mustn't forget is that there was a degree of unrest a decade ago in primary care. There was a feeling that all of these services were coming out of hospital and that somehow primary care would pick up the workload. So patients that 20 years ago would disappear off into hospital outpatients with their diabetes were actually either never getting as far as hospital outpatients or were being sent pretty quickly back into primary care-led diabetes services. So a lot more work without necessarily money or manpower coming into primary care. And a ballot by the BMA in 2001 found that 86% of GPs would consider resigning if a new contract couldn't be secured by the BMA. There was also political will back in 2001 to actually invest money in the NHS, as this slide very nicely shows. You can imagine from 2010 it's going to plateau, if not go down. But you can see from, from 2000 onwards a real increase in the amount of money that was being spent on health care. So that, if you like, is the historical context. And it's important to know how we got to where we are for the pay for performance framework, the quality and outcomes framework introduced in April 2004 to all practices in the United Kingdom. It has well over a 99% uptake. Now, it measures processes rather than outcomes. It provides a lot of money into primary care. Most physicians, most general practitioners, earned an extra £25,000 as a result of the introduction of COIF. Each point was initially worth £76, but is now worth around about £125. And there were 146 quality indicators in that first framework. In comparison, in the United States, there are far fewer indicators in their performance frameworks. And as you can see from this slide here, only 5 to 7% of physicians' pay is actually linked to pay for performance. So a very different system to the one that we've got in the United Kingdom.
This is what Quaff looks like in 2010. As you can see, 70% of the points are actually focused on clinical areas, 86 of the indicators in that particular domain. Now, this slide is important in the sense that it gives you a real flavour of the achievement levels of practices right across the United Kingdom. And what you can see here is that basically practices have scored very highly right from the start in terms of their QOF achievement scores. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about the intended consequences of the quality and outcome framework first of all, then I'm going to move on to the unintended consequences. There were some very positive outcomes of the paper performance scheme. For a starter, it really acted um, to increase computerization across practices across the United Kingdom. It also meant that we had better organized care, there was more systematic protocol-driven care, call and recall systems for the chronic disease monitoring. There was greater job satisfaction. If you remember a few minutes ago, I was saying that in 2001 there was that BMA ballot where the vast majority of general practitioners were going to resign. Now, you can see here that actually peaking in terms of job satisfaction scores um, occurred just after COP was introduced in 2004. Interestingly, it's floating back down again and we'll have the latest data from the uh, satisfaction uh, survey in another few months. And again, it'll be interesting to see whether or not it's actually gone down a, a little further. But COF certainly had um, a, a temporary effect in increasing general practitioners' job satisfaction. Most important of all, though, the quality and outcomes framework improved patient care. And that really is what it's all about. This is just a different coloured version of the slide that was on earlier from those 42 quit practices across England with those three index chronic disease conditions. Now, what you see in 2004 is a step change in achievement. And I'll just move this onto asthma so that you can see this more clearly. With the introduction of the Quality and Outcomes Framework, in terms of patient outcomes, in other words, improved patient care, you see a step change, a statistically significant improvement of the care for patients for the first year or so after COF was introduced. Then it plateaus. And that plateauing is a really important part of the story when I come to talk about removing indicators later on. What's important is that after 2005, there was a continued improvement uh, in outcomes at the patient level, but at the pre quaff rate. Now, some unintended consequences. Well, transaction costs. Quaff costs around about £1 billion of taxpayers' money every year. This is actually a cutting from my local paper. Doctors get 20% pay rise just for doing their jobs. Now, there were all those Daily Mail headlines, GPs now earn a quarter of a million pounds a year, and then you know, somebody pointed out that might be six people or something like that. The fact is, though, that general practitioners did have a significant pay rise back in 2004, and that, I think, has had some impact, uh, at least on our sense of professionalism, and sometimes in terms of our, our patients' views of their general practitioner. There have also been changes to nurses' roles. Um, we went to interview nurses in these quit practices uh, a couple of years ago, and what we found is that very many practice nurses um, understood that much of COF is chronic disease management, and therefore they were the ones actually doing the extra work. Many of the practice nurses said it's great because we no longer have to go to the partners and say, please can I go on a training course? The partners were coming to us and saying, would you like to go on the COPD or the diabetes training course? So in terms of their own professional development, that was really very positive. But there was also an underlying feeling of, well, hang on a sec, we're doing the work, but the partners are sharing the profits. Is that equitable? There were also changes to salaried doctors' roles. Now, bear in mind, something like 43% of the uh, general practice profession is now made up of salaried doctors. Huge increase since, since 2004. But what we found when we talked to just a very small number of salaried doctors, but what we heard constantly was this feeling that the salaried doctors were doing a lot of work, weren't working quite the same hours as partners, but, but were working 80-90% of the hours that partners were doing and were not enabled to become partners, were not enabled to learn about how the practice works, to be involved in practice-based commissioning, to actually really understand what it's like to be a full-time principal. Um, and this, this, this very strong language here, I think they are abusing the younger generation of doctors. So something that I think we need to take very seriously indeed.
I think one of the other unintended consequences that is really the main stick that is used to beat Coif is this notion of medicine by numbers. So this, this quote from Toby Lippmann in the British Journal of General Practice just really a few months after Coif was, was introduced, this notion that somehow if you tick boxes in the consultation, you can't look the patient in the eye and you can't provide holistic care. I mean, there are counter arguments about if patients come down four or five times a, a year, you do not have to ask them how, you know, w w whether or not they're still smoking, if they've come because they're depressed or because someone in the family has died, that, you know, you can use your professional judgment here. But nevertheless, I think there is a, a real and genuine concern here about tick box medicine as a result of the introduction of Quaff. One of the other unintended consequences of the paper performance scheme is actually it appears to be an equitable intervention. I should state very clearly, nobody designed Quaff thinking it would do this. But this lovely piece of work by Tim Doran from Manchester, published in The Lancet a couple of years ago, shows that at the beginning of Quaff, the difference in achievement levels between the practices in the most deprived and the least deprived practice areas was 4.4%. But over a couple of years, that, that uh, gap in uh, achievement had reduced to 0.8%. In other words, the tail of the comet had caught up slightly. So Quaff is an equitable intervention. Tim also looked to see whether or not this was achieved through higher exception reporting rates in the practices in the more deprived areas, and it's not. So an unexpected, very positive unintended consequence of Quaff. So where are we now? State of play. Okay, so Quaff does appear to improve the outcomes of care for a number of chronic disease conditions. However, it plateaus after a year, after a year or so. Quaff does appear to have reduced variation in the quality of care between practices in the most and the least deprived areas, and some staff are happier. As you can see there, the income of general practitioner principals has increased by up to 25%. But, but... I would argue certainly at too great a cost to the public purse, particularly now in a time of real austerity. Is there, it sounds a bit dramatic, a lost tribe of salaried GPs, but you know, 43% of the primary care workforce, many of them thinking that, you know, the way to partnership is perhaps now barred because, partially because of Quaff, and of course the threats to a holistic doctor-patient relationship. Now, a little bit of politics. So, 2010, the white paper comes in, a new government comes in, and their expectations are now that indicators will be removed on a regular basis from Quaff. Their other expectations is that Quaff will be better value for money, so the cost effectiveness of each indicator suddenly becomes much more important than it was before 2010. And the white paper, the recent health white paper, is also very much focused on outcomes. So, Let's have a look at this notion of removing indicators. Why should you remove indicators? How should you remove them? And then what happens? Well, we have done a piece of work in Manchester looking at criteria for retiring indicators. And we think that there are five logical indicators, five logical tests, if you like, to apply to an indicator to see whether or not it's safe to remove. And those tests are that the average reported achievement is high that there is very little variation in that reported achievement. So in other words, a practice in the most deprived area also has a very high achievement as well as practices in the least deprived areas. And that historically that achievement is plateauing. Going back to that quip slide I showed earlier with asthma plateauing. So you want to see that. You also want very low exception reporting rates and you want very low variation between practices in exception reporting rates. Now this very busy slide is really showing you what I mean. Um, so this is DM11. Um, I'm very sad, so I know that this means actually the number of people with diabetes who've had their blood pressure checked. It's worth three points. Three points, remember, is three million pounds. Now, this is a bookend indicator. It's got very high achievement. It's got very low exception reporting rates. And if you look at the top part of the slide there, where you're looking at achievement historically, Hmm, what you see is that, in fact, most practices were doing this long before Quaff was even invented. That rather suggests that if we've been piloting Quaff indicators before 2004, we would not have put this in Quaff because practices were doing it already. But what happens next then? So the government says, let's take some indicators out of Quaff. Well, what happens? 
Now, I think there is an expectation um, from above that this work will continue. So, you know, measuring blood pressure in people with diabetes or whatever other index condition that may be will continue because it's now embedded in primary care. However, when I go around the country talking about Quaff to GPs, many of them say, well, hang on a sec, this isn't the case. If you take away the money, who's going to pay for my HCA who actually does the blood pressure measurement? So it was quite an important question, what does happen if you remove money from these previously financially incented indicators? Now, there's no UK evidence base of note to really help us answer this question, so we looked to Kaiser Permanente in North California to help us answer this particular issue. Uh, Kaiser has got over 2.5 million uh, people um, registered with them in 35 different facilities in North, Cal uh, in North California. And we managed to find four indicators that they financially incentivize that are also part of the quality and outcomes framework. And you can see here, it's yearly assessment of patient level glycemic control, screening for diabetic retinopathy, control of hypertension if you have high blood pressure, and screening for cervical cancer. Now, I'm going to show four slides. It's really about looking at the pattern here rather than worrying about the numbers. So this is hypertension control. Green button means that there is money against the indicator, red button means that there's no money or the money is either not there or has been taken away. So here we go, hypertension control, money all the way along the line with this particular indicator and you can see a slow improvement over time. Next slide, diabetes control, no money, not much happening, put some money against it and diabetes glycemic control improves over time. Now, I think the, the, the last two slides are the, are the most interesting ones. This is diabetic retinopathy screening. Initially, there was money against this particular activity. Then the money was removed. What that slide shows over time is that there is a 3% decrease year on year when the money was removed. And finally, cervical cancer. First of all, there was a financial incentive. Then the financial incentive was removed. During those years where, where the financial incentive was removed, there was a 1.6% decline year on year against that particular activity. Now, what that says to me, loud and clear, is that, okay, it's probably safe to take money away from indicators, but you do have to measure what's actually happening in, the, in that particular indicator area. And you have to decide up front, a priori, what level of, of care you are prepared to go down to before you reintroduce money again. And you also need to explain to patients very carefully what's going on here, because you can see that data like this could easily be misconstrued. Okay, so finally, I'm going to talk about the new QAF process. Um, as you will know, NICE took over the sort of overview of the quality and outcomes framework in April 2009. Uh, so uh, what NICE do is that they collate information about potential new indicators. Uh, all this information goes to a NICE advisory committee which has a number of general practitioners and patients and commissioners and people from social care on it. This committee meets twice a year and decide which uh, indicator areas they think should go forward. Uh, those areas are then given to my team in Manchester and what we then do is develop and pilot the indicators, give the information back to the advisory committee uh, who then decide which indicators should go forward and those are then negotiated. The whole thing takes 18 months to two years. It's not a quick process. But what I hope I'm going to demonstrate to you now is that it does mean that we're going to have much better quality indicators in the quality and outcomes framework uh, in the future. So. The important new addition, really, to this, this whole new scheme is that of piloting potential, uh, potential QAF indicators. Uh, each six months, we work with a group of 30 practices. These practices are representative, generally, of practices across the United Kingdom. So, in other words, we have practices in very rural areas, in very inner city areas, in deprived and less deprived areas, big practices, single-handed practices. We also have um, a couple of practices in Northern Ireland and Scotland and Wales as well. What we do is we go to the practices, uh, we, we um, tell them all about the indicators, we provide them with recodes and with information about how to actually put these new pilot indicators into practice. We extract data from their computer systems at the beginning of the pilot, sometimes in the middle and always at the end of the pilot, so we can see the difference that the indicator has made at a patient level to care and to outcomes. Um, and then we also go back at the end of each pilot process and we talk to anybody in that practice who is involved in piloting the indicator, so to the practice manager, to the practice nurses, to the general practitioners themselves.
In our first pilot, we had 13 indicators. In six clinical areas, you can see what those are there. Um, you'll see that they are all pretty much existing areas in, in QOF. And this is the sort of thing that we test them for. You don't have to worry too much about this indicator, but it gives you a feel that uh, we're looking at the clarity of the wording, we're looking at how acceptable the indicator is to, to the practice, we're looking how feasible it is to implement it in normal uh, primary care. We look at the reliability and the validity of the indicator, and we look at the cost effectiveness as well. Now, I am not a health economist. I am not going to pretend to talk health economist language. But I will talk a little bit about this slide, which I hope tells you enough, which is that actually we look at the net benefit of the indicators when we talk about cost effectiveness. The difficulty is there isn't a lot of evidence out there that we can plug into this particular equation because much of prof, uh, sorry, much of QOF, as you probably know, is very process driven. And so there isn't the data in the guidelines and the evidence base to actually allow us to model this particularly well. However, with the new QOF pilots, we get all of the practices to keep a quite detailed workload diary. So at least in terms of delivery costs from now on, we are actually able to factor in exactly how long it takes to deliver a certain indicator. So in future we will be able to have cost effectiveness data against each of the new potential QOF pilot indicators. Now then, I'm going to end with a story, a story that I hope uh, really demonstrates the value of our pilots. One of the indicators that we piloted um, back a year ago was this palliative care indicator, the percentage of patients on the palliative care register who have a preferred place to receive end-of-life care documented in the record. So practices did this for six months. You would think, what's not to like with this? Surely this is an improvement in care. When we went back to talk to practices, most of them said, well, actually, you know, this isn't much different to what we normally do. This is part of the gold standards framework. This is, this is a normal part of really good palliative care. And we thought, mm, great, not going to be a problem here. And then a few practices started to say, well, actually, there's a problem over timing. When, when do you actually raise this notion of, of your ideal place of death. And then just a handful of practices um, started to tell us stories that made us worry. That what they tended to do was focus on this one isolated question rather than thinking about the individual in front of them as somebody who was very vulnerable and had multiple needs. So one particular general practitioner that, that I talked to talked about how they went to talk to a patient, uh, asked the question about ideal place of death, the patient didn't know, and I said, well, what did you do? Uh, well, I went back a month later and I asked it again, out of context with anything else, and the person didn't know. And I said, well, what did you do then? Well, I just went back a month later and I asked the question again. Again, a contextualized, not the spirit of the indicator, absolutely not what we were getting at. So we presented this information to the advisory committee. So the information that we actually presented to the NICE advisory committee was that yes, this indicator was feasible and it was written in a very clear way and it was reliable, but actually it was not acceptable. And so our overall recommendation is that actually it should probably not be included uh, in uh, the next iteration of QOF. And I'm very pleased to say that the advisory committee agreed with that particular recommendation. And therefore this indicator is not going to see the light of day at any point in the quality and outcomes framework. So, let me finish now and talk a little bit about the cost effectiveness of piloting. In that pilot one, we had 13 indicators and 11 of them went forward to negotiators. I hope I've demonstrated the value, at least in the context of palliative care, of piloting. There are something like 53,000 people at the moment on the palliative care registers across the United Kingdom. Just say 10% of practices have missed the spirit of what we were trying to do. That would mean there were 5,000 very vulnerable people being asked inappropriate questions as an absolutely unintended consequence of that particular indicator. The pilot costs 0.0005% of the overall QOF budget, so I would suggest it's very cost effective. So, to go back to my original question, do financial incentives improve quality of care? Well, yeah, I hope I've demonstrated through that data from the quit practices that actually QOF has improved the clinical effectiveness of some long-term conditions, at least for a time. I hope that Tim Doran's work has convinced you that actually QOF is an unexpected but very positive equitable intervention. So indeed, QOF does appear to improve the equity of care, but it comes at a price, literally a price tag, and also to our professionalism potentially. But I hope in the future 
piloting will make a difference. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>